Section 17 of A Far Country by Winston Churchill. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book 2, Chapter 15. That winter many other entertainments were given in our honor, but the conviction grew upon me that Maud had no real liking for the social side of life, that she acquiesced in it only on my account thus at the very outset of our married career an irritant developed signs of it indeed were apparent from the first when we were preparing the house we had rented for occupancy hurrying away from my office at odd times to furniture and department stores to help decide such momentous questions as curtains carpets chairs and tables i would often spy the tall uncompromising figure of susan peters standing beside maud's while an obliging clerk spread out anxiously rugs or wallpapers for their inspection why don't you get nancy to help you too i ventured to ask her once ours is such a little house compared to nancy's hugh my attitude towards susan had hitherto remained undefined she was tom's wife and tom's affair in spite of her marked disapproval of the modern trend in business and social life a prejudice she had communicated to tom as a bachelor i had not disliked her and it was certain that these views had not mitigated tom's loyalty and affection for me susan had been my friend as had her brother perry and lucia perry's wife they made no secret of the fact that they deplored in me what they were pleased to call plutocratic obsessions nor had their disapproval always been confined to badinage nancy too they looked upon as a renegade i was able to bear their reproaches with the superior good nature that springs from success to point out why the american tradition to which they so fatuously clung was a thing of the past the habit of taking dinner with them at least once a week had continued and their arguments rather amused me if they chose to dwell in a backwater out of touch with the current of great affairs this was a matter to be deplored but i did not feel strongly enough to resent it so long as i remained a bachelor the relationship had not troubled me but now that i was married i began to consider with some alarm its power to affect my welfare it had remained for nancy to inform me that i had married a woman with a mind of her own i had flattered myself that i should be able to control maud to govern her predilections and now at the very beginning of our married life she was showing a disquieting tendency to choose for herself to be sure she had found my intimacy with the peters and blackwoods already formed but it was an intimacy from which i was growing away i should not have quarrelled with her if she had not discriminated nancy made overtures and maud drew back susan presented herself and with annoying perversity and in an extraordinarily brief time maud had become her intimate it seemed to me that she was always at susan's lunching or playing with the children who grew devoted to her or with susan choosing carpets and clothes while more and more frequently we dined with the peters and the blackwoods or they with us with perry's wife maud was scarcely less intimate than with susan this was the more surprising to me since lucia blackwood was a dyed-in-the-wool intellectual a graduate of radcliffe the daughter of a harvard professor perry had fallen in love with her during her visit to susan lucia was perhaps the most influential of the group she scorned the world she held strong views on the higher education of women she had long discarded orthodoxy for what may be called a cambridge stoicism of simple living and high thinking while maud was a strict presbyterian and not in the least given to theories when some months after our homecoming i ventured to warn her gently of the dangers of confining oneself to a coterie especially one of such narrow views her answer was rather bewildering but isn't tom your best friend she asked i admitted that he was 
and you always went there such a lot before we were married this too was undeniable at the same time i replied i have other friends i'm fond of the blackwoods and the peters i am not advocating seeing less of them but their point of view if taken without any antidote is rather narrowing we ought to see all kinds i suggested with a fine restraint you mean more worldly people she said with her disconcerting directness not necessarily worldly i struggled on people who know more of the world yes who understand it better maude sighed i do try hugh i return their calls i do try to be nice to them but somehow i don't seem to get along with them easily i'm not myself they make me shy it's because i'm provincial nonsense i protested you're not a bit provincial and it was true her dignity and self-possession redeemed her nancy was not once mentioned but i think she was in both our minds since my marriage too i had begun to resent a little the attitude of tom and susan and the blackwoods of humorous yet affectionate tolerance toward my professional activities and financial creed though maud showed no disposition to take this seriously i did suspect however that they were more and more determined to rescue maud from what they would have termed a frivolous career and on one of these occasions so exasperating in married life when a slight cause for pique tempts a husband or wife to try a case before a friendly jury maud remarked it at the dinner-table that i thought she ought to go out more than she did i have forgotten the conversation that went before that's right don't let him turn you into a society doll perry put in you were created for something better i was furious but i repressed my temper until maud and i were alone why perry only said that in fun she exclaimed in surprise i don't care to be made an idiot of i said perry has an idea that all wisdom will die with him of course if you prefer his way of looking at things but i don't you how can you be so cruel and unjust and silly apparently you attach more importance to his views and susan's and lucia's than to mine she gazed at me for a moment with widened eyes as though i had suddenly become a stranger and then falling into a chair burst into weeping oh i know i'm a failure i heard her cry convulsively i'm not what you want i can't ever be what you want you really don't care for me why did you marry me i was appalled yet for the instant my exasperation was rather heightened by this enigmatic result i paced up and down the room drew aside the curtain and gazed out at the arc lights on the street and then back at her the sobbing continued presently i went over and laid my hand on her shoulder for the first time she shrank from my touch i didn't mean to hurt your feelings maud pressing her handkerchief to her eyes she fairly ran out of the room and up the stairs i heard her close the bedroom door after her and turn the key in the lock i went to my study and began to go over some papers i had brought home with me trying and at first succeeding in exerting a power which for many years i had cultivated of shutting out all disturbing human relationships of suppressing my feelings but presently my attention to the work relaxed and i began to ask myself whether this affair were only a squall something to be looked for once in a while on the seas of matrimony and weathered or whether maud had not after all been right when she declared that i had made a mistake and that we were not fitted for one another in this gloomy view endless years of incompatibility stretched ahead and for the first time i began to rehearse with a certain cold detachment 
the chain of apparently accidental events which had led up to my marriage to consider the gradual blindness that had come over my faculties and finally to wonder whether judgment ever entered into sexual selection would maude have relapsed into this senseless fit if she had realized how fortunate she was for i was prepared to give her what thousands of women longed for position and influence my resentment rose again against perry and tom and i began to attribute their lack of appreciation of my achievements to jealousy they had not my ability this was the long and short of it i pondered also regretfully on my bachelor days and for the first time i who had worked so hard to achieve freedom felt the pressure of the yoke i had fitted over my own shoulders i had voluntarily though unwittingly returned to slavery this was what had happened and what was to be done about it i would not consider divorce well i should have to make the best of it whether this conclusion brought on a mood of reaction i am unable to say i was still annoyed by what seemed to the masculine mind a senseless and dramatic performance on maude's part an incomprehensible case of nerves nevertheless there stole into my mind many recollections of maude's affection many passages between us and my eye chanced to fall on the inkwell she had bought me out of the allowance i gave her an unanticipated pity welled up within me for her loneliness her despair in that room upstairs i got up and hesitated a counteracting inhibiting wave passed through me i hardened i began to walk up and down a prey to conflicting impulses something whispered go to her another voice added for your own peace of mind at any rate i rejected the intrusion of this motive as unworthy turned out the light and groped my way upstairs the big clock in the hall struck twelve i listened outside the door of the bedroom but all was silent within i knocked maude i said in a low voice there was no response maude let me in i didn't mean to be unkind i'm sorry after an interval i heard her say i'd rather stay here tonight but at length after more entreaty and self-abasement on my part she opened the door the room was dark we sat down together on the window seat and all at once she relaxed and her head fell on my shoulder and she began weeping again i held her the alternating moods still running through me hugh she said at length how could you be so cruel when you know i love you and would do anything for you i didn't mean to be cruel maude i answered i know you didn't but at times you seem so indifferent and you can't understand how it hurts i haven't anybody but you now and it's in your power to make me happy or or miserable later on i tried to explain my point of view to justify myself all i mean i concluded at length is that my position is a little different from perry's and tom's they can afford to isolate themselves but i'm thrown professionally with the men who are building up this city some of them like ralph hambleton and mr ogilvy i've known all my life life isn't so simple for us maude we can't ignore the social side i understand she said contentedly you are more of a man of affairs much more than tom or perry and you have greater responsibilities and wider interests i'm really very proud of you only don't you think you are a little too sensitive about yourself when you are teased i let this pass i give a paragraph from a possible biography of hugh parrott which as then seemed not improbable might in the future have been written by some aspiring young worshipper of success
on his return from a brief but delightful honeymoon in england mr parrott took up again with characteristic vigour the practice of the law he was entering upon the prime years of manhood golden opportunities confronted him as indeed they confronted other men but parrott had the foresight to take advantage of them and his training under theodore watling was now to produce results the reputations had already been made of some of that remarkable group of financial geniuses who were chiefly instrumental in bringing about the industrial revolution begun after the civil war at the same time as is well known a political leadership developed that gave proof of a deplorable blindness to the logical necessity of combinations in business the lawyer with initiative and brains became an indispensable factor etc etc the biography might have gone on to relate my association with and important services to adolf scherer in connection with his constructive dream shortly after my return from abroad in answer to his summons i found him at heinrich's his napkin tucked into his shirt front and a dish of his favourite sausages before him so the honeymoon is over he said and pressed my hand you are right to come back to business and after a while you can have another honeymoon eh i have had many since i married and how long do you think was my first a day i was a foreman then and the wedding was at six o'clock in the morning we went into the country the wife and i he laid down his knife and fork possessed by the memory i have grown rich since and we've been to europe and back to germany and travelled on the best ships and stayed at the best hotels and i never enjoyed a holiday more than that day it wasn't long afterwards i went to mr durrett and told him how he could save much money he was always ready to listen mr durrett when an employee had anything to say he was a big man an iron master ah he would be astonished if only he could wake up now he would not only have to be an iron master i agreed but a financier and a railroad man to boot a jack of all trades laughed mr scherer that's what we are men in my position well it was comparatively simple then when we had no sherman law and crazy statutes such as some of the states are passing to bother us what has got into the politicians that they are indulging in such foolishness he exclaimed more warmly we try to build up a trade for this country and they're doing their best to tie our hands and tear it down when i was in washington the other day i was talking with one of those western senators whose state has passed those laws he said to me mr scherer i've been making a study of the boyne ironworks you are clever men but you are building up monopolies which we propose to stop by what means i asked rebates for one said he you get preferential rates from your railroad which give you advantages over your competitors foolishness mr scherer exclaimed i tell him the railroad is a private concern built up by private enterprise and it has a right to make special rates for large shippers no railroads are public carriers with no right to make special rates i ask him what else he objects to and he says patented processes as if we don't have a right to our own patents we buy them i buy them when other steel companies won't touch em what is that but enterprise and business foresight and taking risks and then he begins to talk about the terror of taking money out of the pockets of american consumers and making men like me rich i have come to washington to get the tariff raised on steel rails and watling and other senators we send down there are raising it for us we are building up monopolies well suppose we are we can't help it even if we want to has he ever made a study of the other side of the question the competition side of course he hasn't he brought down his beer mug heavily on the table in times of excitement his speech suggested the german idiom abruptly his air grew mysterious he glanced around the room now becoming empty and lowered his voice i have been thinking a long time i have a little scheme he said and i have been to washington to see watling to talk over it well he thinks much of you founds and ripon are good lawyers 
but they are not smart like you see parrot he says and he can come down and talk to me so i ask you to come here that is why i say you are wise to get home honeymoons can wait eh i smiled appreciatively they talk about monopoly those populist senators but i ask you what is a man in my place to do if you don't eat somebody eats you is it not so like the boa constrictors that is modern business look at the keystone plate people over there at morris for years we sold them steel billets from which to make their plates and three months ago they served notice on us that they are getting ready to make their own billets they buy mines north of the lakes and are building their plant here is a big customer gone next year maybe the empire tube company goes into the business of making crude steel and many more thousands of tons go from us what is left for us parrot obviously you've got to go into the tube and plate business yourselves i said so cried mr scherer triumphantly or it is close up we are not fools no we will not lie down and be eaten like lambs for any law dickinson can put his hand on the capital and i i have already bought a tract on the lakes at bolivar i have already got a plant designed with the latest modern machinery i can put the ore right there i can send the coke back from here in cars which would otherwise be empty and manufacture tubes at eight dollars a ton less than they are selling if we can make tubes we can make plates and if we can make plates we can make boilers and beams and girders and bridges it is not like it was but where is it all leading my friend the time will come is right on us now in respect to many products when the market will be flooded with tubes and plates and girders and then we'll have to find a way to limit production and the inefficient mills will all be forced to shut down the logic seemed unanswerable even had i cared to answer it he unfolded his campaign the boyne ironworks was to become the boyne ironworks limited owner of various subsidiary companies some of which were as yet blissfully ignorant of their fate all had been thought out as calmly as the partition of poland only lawyers were required and ultimately after the process of acquisition should have been completed a delicate document was to be drawn up which would pass through the meshes of that annoying statutory net the sherman anti-trust law new mines were to be purchased extending over a certain large area wide coal deposits little strips of railroad to tap them the competition of the keystone plate people was to be met by acquiring and bringing up to date the plate mills of king and son over the borders of a sister state the Summersworth bridge and construction company and the gring steel and wire company were to be absorbed when all of this should have been accomplished there would be scarcely a process in the steel industry from the smelting of the ore to the completion of a bridge which the boyne iron works could not undertake such was the beginning of the lateral extension period two can play at that game mr scherer said and if those fellows could only be content to let well enough alone to continue buying their crude steel from us there wouldn't be any trouble it was evident however that he really welcomed the trouble that he was going into battle with enthusiasm he had already picked out his points of attack and was marching on them life for him would have been a poor thing without new conflicts to absorb his energy and he had already made of the boyne ironworks with its open hearth furnaces a marvel of modern efficiency that had opened the eyes of the steel world and had drawn the attention of a personality in new york a personality who was one of the new and dominant type that had developed with such amazing rapidity the banker dinosaur preying upon and superseding the industrial dinosaur conquering type of the preceding age builder of the railroads mills and manufactories the banker dinosaurs the gigantic ones were in wall street and strove among themselves for the industrial spoils accumulated by their predecessors it was characteristic of these monsters that they never fought in the open unless they were forced to then the earth rocked 
huge economic structures tottered and fell and much dust arose to obscure the vision of smaller creatures who were bewildered and terrified such disturbances were called panics and were blamed by the newspapers on the democratic party or on the reformers who had wantonly assailed established institutions these dominant bankers had contrived to gain control of the savings of thousands and thousands of fellow citizens who had deposited them in banks or paid them into insurance companies and with the power thus accumulated had sallied forth to capture railroads and industries the railroads were the strategic links with these in hand certain favoured industrial concerns could be fed and others starved into submission adolf scherer might be said to represent a transitional type for he was not only an iron master who knew every detail of his business who kept it ahead of the times he was also a strategist wise in his generation making friends with the railroad while there had yet been time at length securing rebates and favors and when that railroad which had been constructed through the enterprise and courage of such men as nathaniel durrett had passed under the control of the banker personality to whom i have referred and had become part of a system adolf scherer remained in alliance and continued to receive favors i can well remember the time when the ultimate authority of the railroad was transferred quietly to wall street alexander barber its president had been a great man but after that he bowed in certain matters to a greater one i have digressed mr scherer unfolded his scheme talking about units as calmly as though they were checkers on a board instead of huge fiery reverberating mills where thousands and thousands of human beings toiled day and night beings with families and hopes and fears whose destinies were to be dominated by the will of the man who sat opposite me but did not he in his own person represent the triumph of that american creed of opportunity he too had been through the fire had sweated beside the blasts had handled the ingots of steel he was one of the fittest who had survived and looked it had he no memories of the terrors of that struggle adolf scherer had grown to be a giant and yet without me without my profession he was a helpless giant at the mercy of those alert and vindictive lawmakers who sought to restrain and hamper him to check his growth with their webs how stimulating the idea of his dependence how exhilarating too the thought that that vision which had first possessed me as an undergraduate on my visit to jerry keim was at last to be realized i had now become the indispensable associate of the few who divided the spoils i was to have a share in these myself you're a young parrot mr scherer concluded but watling has confidence in you and you will consult him frequently i believe in the young men and i have already seen something of you so when i returned to the office i wrote theodore watling a letter expressing my gratitude for the position he had so to speak willed me of confidential legal adviser to adolf scherer though the opportunity had thrust itself upon me suddenly and sooner than i expected it i was determined to prove myself worthy of it i worked as i had never worked before making trips to new york to consult leading members of this new branch of my profession there trips to washington to see my former chief there too numerous conferences with local personages with mr dickinson and mr grierson and judah b talent whose newspaper was most useful there were consultations and negotiations of a delicate nature with the owners and lawyers of other companies to be taken in nor was it all legal work in the older and narrower sense men who are playing for principalities are making war some of our operations had all the excitement of war there was information to be got and it was got somehow 
modern war involves a spy system and a friendly telephone company is not to be despised and all of this work from first to last had to be done with extreme caution moribund distinctions of right and wrong did not trouble me for the modern man labours religiously when he knows that evolution is on his side for all of these operations a corps of counsel had been employed including the firm of harrington and bowes next to theodore watling joel harrington was deemed the ablest lawyer in the city we organized in due time the corporation known as the boyne iron works limited a trust agreement was drawn up that was a masterpiece of its kind one that caused first and last meddling officials in the department of justice at washington no little trouble and perplexity i was proud of the fact that i had taken no small part in its composition in short in addition to certain emoluments and opportunities for investment i emerged from the affair firmly established in the good graces of adolf scherer and with a reputation practically made a year or so after the boyne company limited came into existence i chanced one morning to go down to the new schwele hotel to meet a new yorker of some prominence and was awaiting him in the lobby when i overheard a conversation between two commercial travellers who were sitting with their backs to me did you notice that fellow who went up to the desk a moment ago asked one the young fellow in the grey suit sure who is he he looks as if he was pretty well fixed i guess he is replied the first that's parrot he's sharer's confidential counsel he used to be senator watling's partner but they say he's even got something on the old man in spite of the feverish life i led i was still undoubtedly young-looking and in this i was true to the incoming type of successful man our fathers appeared staid at six-and-thirty clothes of course made some difference and my class and generation did not wear the sombre and cumbersome kind with skirts and tails i patronized a tailor in new york my chestnut hair a little darker than my father's had been showed no signs of turning gray although it was thinning a little at the crown of my forehead and i wore a small moustache clipped in a straight line above the mouth this made me look less like a college youth thanks to a strong pigment in my skin derived probably from scotch-irish ancestors my colour was fresh I have spoken of my life as feverish, and yet I am not so sure that this word completely describes it. It was full to overflowing, one side of it, and I did not miss, save vaguely in rare moments of weariness, any other side that might have been developed. I was busy all day long, engaged in affairs I deemed to be alone of vital importance in the universe. I was convinced that the welfare of the city demanded that supreme financial power should remain in the hands of the group of men with whom i was associated and whose battles i fought in the courts in the legislature in the city council and sometimes in washington although they were well cared for there by every means ingenuity could devise their enemies were to be driven from the field and they were to be protected from blackmail a sense of importance sustained me and i remembered in that first flush of a success for which i had not waited too long what a secret satisfaction it was to pick up the era and see my name embedded in certain dignified notices of board meetings transactions of weight or cases known to the initiated as significant mr scherer's interests were taken care of by mr hugh parrott the fact that my triumphs were modestly set forth gave me more pleasure than if they had been trumpeted in headlines although i might have started out in practice for myself my affection and regard for mr watling kept me in the firm which became watling founds and parrot and a new arrangement was entered into mr ripon retired on account of ill health there were instances however when a certain amount of annoying publicity was inevitable such was the famous galligan case which occurred some three or four years after my marriage 
aloysius galligan was a brakeman and his legs had become paralyzed as the result of an accident that was the result of defective sills on a freight car he had sued and been awarded damages of fifteen thousand dollars to the amazement and indignation of miller gorse the supreme court to which the railroad had appealed affirmed the decision it wasn't the single payment of fifteen thousand dollars that the railroad cared about of course a precedent might be established for compensating maimed employees which would be expensive in the long run carelessness could not be proved in this instance gorse sent for me i had been away with maud at the sea for two months and had not followed the case you've got to take charge parrot and get a rehearing see bearing and find out who in the deuce is to blame for this chesley's one of course we ought never to have permitted his nomination for the supreme bench it was against my judgment but varney and gill assured me that he was all right i saw judge bearing that evening we sat on a plush sofa in the parlor of his house in baker street i had a notion gorse would be mad he said but it looked to me as if they had it on us parrot i didn't see how we could do anything else but affirm without being too rank of course if he feels that way and you want to make a motion for a rehearing i'll see what can be done something's got to be done i replied can't you see what such a decision lets them in for all right said the judge who knew an order when he heard one i guess we can find an error he was not a little frightened by the report of mr gorse's wrath for election day was approaching say you wouldn't take me for a sentimental man now would you i smiled at the notion of it well i'll own up to you this kind of got under my skin that galligan is a fine-looking fellow if there ever was one and he'll never be of a bit of use any more of course the case was plain sailing and they ought to have had the verdict but that lawyer of his handled it to the queen's taste if i do say so he made me feel real bad by god as if it was my own son ed who'd been battered up lord i can't forget the look in that man galligan's eyes i hate to go through it again and reverse it but i guess i'll have to now the judge sat gazing at the flames playing over his gas log who was the lawyer i asked a man by the name of krebs he replied never heard of him before he's just moved to the city this city i ejaculated the judge glanced at me interestedly the city of course what do you know about him well i answered when i had recovered a little from the shock for it was a distinct shock he lived in elkington he was the man who stirred up the trouble in the legislature about bill seven o nine the judge slapped his knee that fellow he exclaimed and ruminated why didn't somebody tell me he added complainingly why didn't miller gorse let me know about it instead of licking up a fuss after it's all over of all men of my acquaintance i had thought the judge the last to grow maudlin over the misfortunes of those who were weak or unfortunate enough to be defeated and crushed in the struggle for existence and it was not without food for reflection that i departed from his presence to make mr bering feel bad was no small achievement and krebs had been responsible for it of course not galligan krebs had turned up once more it seemed as though he were destined to haunt me well i made up my mind that he should not disturb me again at any rate i at least had learned to eliminate sentimentality from business and it was not without deprecation i remembered my experience with him at the capitol when he had made me temporarily ashamed of my connection with bill seven o nine i had got over that and when i entered the courtroom the tribunal having graciously granted a rehearing on the ground that it had committed an error in the law my feelings were of lively curiosity and zest i had no disposition to underrate his abilities but i was fortified by the consciousness of a series of triumphs behind me by a sense of association with prevailing forces against which he was helpless 
i could afford to take a superior attitude in regard to one who was destined always to be dramatic as the case proceeded i was rather disappointed on the whole that he was not dramatic not even as dramatic as he had been when he defied the powers in the legislature he had changed but little he still wore ill-fitting clothes but i was forced to acknowledge that he seemed to have gained in self-control in presence he had nodded at me before the case was called as he sat beside his maimed client and i had been on the alert for a hint of reproach in his glance there was none i smiled back at him he did not rant he seemed to have rather a remarkable knowledge of the law in a conversational tone he described the sufferings of the man in the flannel shirt beside him but there could be no question of the fact that he did produce an effect the spectators were plainly moved and it was undeniable that some of the judges wore rather a sheepish look as they toyed with their watch chains or moved the stationery in front of them they had seen maimed men before they had heard impassioned sentimental lawyers talk about wives and families and god and justice krebs did none of this just how he managed to bring the thing home to those judges to make them ashamed of their role just how he managed in spite of my fortified attitude to revive something of that sense of discomfort i had experienced at the state house is difficult to say it was because i think he contrived through the intensity of his own sympathy to enter into the body of the man whose cause he pleaded to feel the despair in galligan's soul an impression that was curiously conveyed despite the dignified limits to which he confined his speech it was strange that i began to be rather sorry for him that i felt a certain reluctant regret that he should thus squander his powers against overwhelming odds what was the use of it all at the end his voice became more vibrant though he did not raise it as he condemned the railroad for its indifference to human life for its contention that men were cheaper than rolling stock i encountered him afterward in the corridor i had made a point of seeking him out perhaps from some vague determination to prove that our last meeting in the little restaurant at the capital had left no traces of embarrassment in me i was in fact rather aggressively anxious to reveal myself to him as one who has thriven on the views he condemned as one in whose unity of mind there is no rift he was alone apparently waiting for some one leaning against a steam radiator in one of his awkward angular poses looking out of the courthouse window how are you i said blithely so you've left elkington for a wider field i wondered whether my alert cousin-in-law george hutchins had made it too hot for him he turned to me unexpectedly a face of profound melancholy his expression had in it oddly a trace of sternness and i was somewhat taken aback by this evidence that he was still bearing vicariously the troubles of his client so deep had been the thought i had apparently interrupted that he did not realize my presence at first oh it's you parrot yes i've left elkington he said something of a surprise to run up against you suddenly like this i expected to see you he answered gravely and the slight emphasis he gave the pronoun implied not only a complete knowledge of the situation and of the part i had taken in it but also a greater rebuke than if his accusation had been direct but i clung to my affability if i can do anything for you let me know i told him he said nothing he did not even smile at this moment he was opportunely joined by a man who had the appearance of a labor leader and i walked away i was resentful my mood in brief was that of a man who has done something foolish and is inclined to talk to himself aloud but the mood was complicated made the more irritating by the paradoxical fact that that last look he had given me 
seemed to have borne the traces of affection it is perhaps needless to add that the court reversed its former decision end of section seventeen Section 18 of A Far Country by Winston Churchill. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book 2, Chapter 16. The Pilot published a series of sensational articles and editorials about the Galligan matter, a picture of Galligan, an account of the destitute state of his wife and family. The time had not yet arrived when such newspapers dared to attack the probity of our courts, but a system of law that permitted such palpable injustice because of technicalities was bitterly denounced. What chance had a poor man against such a moloch as the railroad, even with a lawyer of such ability as had been exhibited by Herman Krebs? Krebs was praised, and the attention of Mr. Lawler's readers was called to the fact that Krebs was the man who, some years before, had opposed single-handed in the legislature the notorious bill, number 709. It was well known in certain circles, the editorial went on to say, that this legislation had been drawn by theodore watling in the interests of the boyne ironworks etc etc hugh parrott had learned at the feet of an able master this first sight of my name thus opprobriously flung to the multitude gave me an unpleasant shock i had seen mr scherer attacked mr gorse attacked and mr watling i had all along realized vaguely that my turn would come and i thought myself to have acquired a compensating philosophy i threw the sheet into the waste basket presently picked it out again and re-read the sentence containing my name well there were certain penalties that every career must pay i had become at last a marked man, and I recognized the fact that this assault would be the forerunner of many. I tried to derive some comfort and amusement from the thought of certain operations of mine that Mr. Lawler had not discovered, that would have been matters of peculiar interest to his innocent public, certain extra-legal operations, at the time when the Bovine Corporation was being formed, for instance, and how they would have licked their chops had they learned of that manoeuvre by which i had managed to have one of mr scherer's subsidiary companies in another state with property and assets amounting to more than twenty millions reorganized under the laws of new jersey and the pending case thus transferred to the federal court where we won hands down this galligan affair was nothing to that nevertheless it was annoying as i sat in the street car on my way homeward a man beside me was reading the pilot i had a queer sensation as he turned the page and scanned the editorial and i could not help wondering what he and the thousands like him thought of me what he would say if i introduced myself and asked his opinion perhaps he did not think at all undoubtedly he and the public at large were used to mr lawler's daily display of injustices nevertheless like slow acid they must be eating into the public consciousness it was an outrage this freedom of the press with renewed exasperation i thought of krebs of his disturbing and almost uncanny faculty of following me up why couldn't he have remained in elkington why did he have to follow me here to make capital out of a case that might never have been heard of except for him i was still in this disagreeable frame of mind when i turned the corner by my house and caught sight of maud in the front yard bending bareheaded over a bed of late flowers which the frost had spared the evening was sharp the dusk already gathering you'll catch cold i called to her she looked up at the sound of my voice they'll soon be gone 
she sighed referring to the flowers i hate winter she put her hand through my arm and we went into the house the curtains were drawn a fire was crackling on the hearth the lamps were lighted and as i dropped into a chair this living room of ours seemed to take on the air of a refuge from the vague threatening sinister things of the world without i felt i had never valued it before maude took up her sewing and sat down beside the table hugh she said suddenly i read something in the newspaper my exasperation flared up again where did you get that disreputable sheet i demanded at the dressmaker's she answered i i just happened to see the name parrot it's just politics i declared stirring up discontent by misrepresentation jealousy she leaned forward in her chair gazing into the flames then it isn't true that this poor man galligan isn't that his name was cheated out of the damages he ought to have to keep himself and his family alive you must have been talking to perry or susan i said they seem to be convinced that i am an oppressor of the poor hugh the tone in which she spoke my name smote me how can you say that how can you doubt their loyalty and mine do you think they would undermine you and to me behind your back i didn't mean that of course maude i was annoyed about something else and tom and perry have an air of deprecating most of the enterprises in which i am professionally engaged it's very well for them to talk all perry has to do is sit back and take in receipts from the boyne street car line and tom is content if he gets a few commissions every week they're like militiamen criticizing soldiers under fire i know they're good friends of mine but sometimes i lose patience with them i got up and walked to the window and came back again and stood before her i'm sorry for this man galligan i went on i can't tell you how sorry but few people who are not on the inside so to speak grasp the fact that big corporations like the railroad are looked upon as fair game for every kind of parasite not a day passes in which attempts are not made to bleed them some of these cases are pathetic it had cost the railroad many times fifteen thousand dollars to fight galligan's case but if they had paid it they would have laid themselves open to thousands of similar demands dividends would dwindle the stockholders have a right to a fair return on their money galligan claims that there was a defective sill on the car which is said to have caused the wreck if damages are paid on that basis it means the daily inspection of every car which passes over their lines and more than that there are certain defects as in the present case which an inspection would not reveal when a man accepts employment on a railroad he assumes a certain amount of personal risk it's not precisely a chambermaid's job and the lawyer who defends such cases whatever his personal feelings may be cannot afford to be swayed by them he must take the larger view why didn't you tell me about it before she asked well i didn't think it of enough importance these things are all in the day's work but mr krebs how strange that he should be there connected with the case i made an effort to control myself your old friend i said i believe you have a sentiment about him she looked up at me scarcely that she replied gravely with the literalness that often characterized her but he isn't a person easily forgotten he may be queer one may not agree with his views but after the experience i had with him i've never been able to look at him in the way george does for instance or even as father does or even as i do i supplied well perhaps not even as you do she answered calmly i believe you once told me however that you thought him a fanatic but sincere he's certainly a fanatic i exclaimed 
but sincere hugh you still think him sincere you seem a good deal concerned about a man you've laid eyes on but once she considered this yes it is surprising she admitted but it's true i was sorry for him but i admired him i was not only impressed by his courage in taking charge of me but also by the trust and affection the work people showed he must be a good man however mistaken he may be in the methods he employs and life is cruel to those people life is life i observed neither you nor i nor krebs is able to change it has he come here to practice she asked after a moment yes do you want me to invite him to dinner and seeing that she did not reply i continued in spite of my explanation i suppose you think because krebs defended the man galligan that a monstrous injustice has been done that is unworthy of you she said bending over her stitch i began to pace the room again as was my habit when overwrought well i was going to tell you about this affair if you had not forestalled me by mentioning it yourself it isn't pleasant to be vilified by rascals who make capital out of vilification and a man has a right to expect some sympathy from his wife did i ever deny you that hugh she asked only you don't ever seem to need it or want it and there are things i pursued things in a man's province that a woman ought to accept from her husband things which in the very nature of the case she can know nothing about but a woman must think for herself she declared she shouldn't become a mere automaton and these questions involve so much people are discussing them the magazines and periodicals are beginning to take them up i stared at her somewhat appalled by this point of view there had indeed been signs of its development before now but i had not heeded them and for the first time i beheld maude in a new light oh it's not that i don't trust you she continued i'm open to conviction but i must be convinced your explanation of this galligan case seems a sensible one although it's depressing but life is hard and depressing sometimes i've come to realize that i want to think over what you've said i want to talk over it some more why don't you tell me more of what you're doing if you only would confide in me as you have now i can't help seeing that we are growing farther and farther apart that business your career is taking all of you and leaving me nothing she faltered and went on again it's difficult to tell you this you never give me the chance and it's not for my sake alone but for yours too you are growing more and more self-centred surrounding yourself with a hard shell you don't realize it but tom notices it perry notices it it hurts them it's that they complain of hugh she cried appealingly sensing my resentment forestalling the words of defence ready on my lips i know that you are busy that many men depend on you it isn't that i'm not proud of you and your success but you don't understand what a woman craves she doesn't want only to be a good housekeeper a good mother she wants to share a little at any rate in the life of her husband in his troubles as well as in his successes she wants to be of some little use of some little help to him my feelings were reduced to a medley but you are a help to me a great help i protested she shook her head i wish i were she said it suddenly occurred to me that she might be i was softened and alarmed by the spectacle she had revealed of the widening breach between us i laid my hand on her shoulder well i'll try to do better maude she looked up at me questioningly yet gratefully through a mist of tears but her reply whatever it might have been was forestalled by the sound of shouts and laughter in the hallway she sprang up and ran to the door
it's the children she exclaimed they've come home from susan's party it begins indeed to look as if i were writing this narrative upside down for i have said nothing about children perhaps one reason for this omission is that i did not really appreciate them but i found it impossible to take the same minute interest in them as tom for instance who was apparently not content alone with the six which he possessed but had adopted mine one of them little sarah said uncle tom before father i do not mean to say that i had not occasional moments of tenderness toward them but they were out of my thoughts much of the time i have often wondered since how they regarded me how in their little minds they defined the relationship generally when i arrived home in the evening i liked to sit down before my study fire and read the afternoon newspapers or a magazine but occasionally i went at once to the nursery for a few moments to survey with complacency the medley of toys on the floor and to kiss all three they received my caresses with a certain shyness the two younger ones at least as though they were at a loss to place me as a factor in the establishment they tumbled over each other to greet maud and even tom if i were an enigma to them what must they have thought of him sometimes i would discover him on the nursery floor with one or two of his own children building towers and castles and railroad stations or forts to be attacked and demolished by regiments of lead soldiers he was growing comfortable-looking if not exactly stout prematurely paternal oddly willing to renounce the fiercer joys of life the joys of acquisition of conquest of youth you'd better come home with me chickabiddy he would say that father of yours doesn't appreciate you he's too busy getting rich chickabiddy was his name for little sarah half of the name stuck to her and when she was older we called her biddy she would gaze at him questioningly her eyes like blue flower cups a strange little mixture of solemnity and bubbling mirth of shyness and impulsiveness she had fat legs that creased above the tops of the absurd little boots that looked to be too tight sometimes she rolled and tumbled in an ecstasy of abandon and again she would sit motionless as though absorbed in dreams her hair was like corn silk in the sun twisting up into soft curls after her bath when she sat rosily presiding over her supper-table as i look back over her early infancy i realize that i loved her although it is impossible for me to say how much of this love is retrospective why i was not mad about her every hour of the day is a puzzle to me now why indeed was i not mad about all three of them there were moments when i held and kissed them when something within me melted moments when i was away from them and thought of them but these moments did not last the something within me hardened again i became indifferent my family was wiped out of my consciousness as though it had never existed there was matthew for instance the oldest when he arrived he was to maud a never-ending miracle she would have his crib brought into her room and i would find her leaning over the bedside gazing at him with a rapt expression beyond my comprehension to me he was just a brick-red morsel of humanity all folds and wrinkles and not at all remarkable in any way maud used to annoy me by getting out of bed in the middle of the night when he cried and at such times i was apt to wonder at the odd trick the life-force had played me and ask myself why i got married at all it was a queer method of carrying on the race later on i began to take a cursory interest in him to watch for signs in him of certain characteristics of my own youth which in the philosophy of my manhood i had come to regard as defects and it disturbed me somewhat to see these signs appear i wished him to be what i had become by force of will a fighter but he was a sensitive child anxious for approval not robust though spiritual rather than delicate even in comparative infancy he cared more for books than toys and his greatest joy was in being read to 
in spite of these traits perhaps because of them there was a sympathy between us from the time that he could talk the child seemed to understand me occasionally i surprised him gazing at me with a certain wistful look that comes back to me as i write morton tom used to call alexander the great because he was a fighter from the cradle beating his elder brother too considerate to strike back and likewise when opportunity offered his sister and appropriating their toys a self-sufficient doughty young man with a round head that withstands many blows taking by nature to competition and buccaneering in general i did not love him half so much as i did matthew if such intermittent emotions as mine may be called love it was a standing joke of mine which maude strongly resented that morton resembled cousin george of elkington imbued with the highest ambition of my time i had set my bark on a great circle and almost before i realized it the bark was burdened with a wife and family and the steering had insensibly become more difficult for maude cared nothing about the destination and when i took any hand off the wheel our ship showed a tendency to make for a quiet harbour thus the social initiative which i believe should have been the woman's was thrust back on me it was almost incredible yet indisputable in a day when most american women were credited with a craving for social ambition that i of all men should have married a wife in whom the craving was wholly absent she might have had what other women would have given their souls for there were many reasons why i wished her to take what i deemed her proper place in the community as my wife not that i cared for what is called society in the narrow sense with me it was a logical part of a broader scheme of life an auxiliary rather than an essential but a needful auxiliary a means of dignifying and adorning the position i was taking not only that but i felt the need of intercourse of intercourse of a lighter and more convivial nature with men and women who saw life as i saw it in the evenings when we did not go out into that world our city afforded ennui took possession of me i had never learned to care for books i had no resources outside of my profession and when i was not working on some legal problem i dawdled over the newspapers and went to bed i don't mean to imply that our existence outside of our continued intimacy with the peters and the blackwoods was socially isolated we gave little dinners that maude carried out with skill and taste but it was i who suggested them we went out to other dinners sometimes to nancy's though we saw less and less of her sometimes to other houses but maude had given evidence of domestic tastes and a disinclination for gaiety that those who entertained more were not slow to sense i should have liked to take a larger house but i felt the futility of suggesting it the children were still small and she was occupied with them meanwhile i beheld and at times with considerable irritation the social world changing growing larger and more significant a more important function of that higher phase of american existence the new century seemed definitely to have initiated a segregative process was a way to which maude was wholly indifferent our city was throwing off its social conservatism wealth which implied ability and superiority was playing a greater part entertainments were more luxurious lines more strictly drawn we had an elaborate country club for those who could afford expensive amusements much of this transformation had been due to the initiative and leadership of nancy durrett great and sudden wealth however if combined with obscure antecedents and questionable qualifications was still looked upon askance in spite of the fact that adolf scherer had put us on the map the family of the great ironmaster still remained outside of the social pale he himself might have entered had it not been for his wife who was supposed to be queer 
who remained at home in her house opposite gallatin park and made little german cakes a huge house which an unknown architect had taken unusual pains to make pretentious and hideous for it was rhenish moorish and victorian by turns its geometric grounds matched those of the park itself a monument to bad taste in landscape the neighbourhood was highly respectable and inhabited by families of german extraction there were two flaxen-haired daughters who had just graduated from an expensive boarding school in new york where they had received the polish needful for future careers but the careers were not forthcoming i was thrown constantly with adolf scherer i had earned his gratitude i had become necessary to him but after the great coup whereby he had fulfilled mr watling's prophecy and become the chief factor in our business world he began to show signs of discontent of an irritability that seemed foreign to his character and that puzzled me one day however i stumbled upon the cause of this fermentation to wonder that i had not discovered it before in many ways adolf scherer was a child we were sitting in the boying club money yes he exclaimed apropos of some demand made upon him by a charitable society they come to me for my money there is always scherer they say he will make up the deficit in the hospitals but what is it they do for me nothing do they invite me to their houses to their parties this was what he wanted then social recognition i said nothing but i saw my opportunity i had the clue now to a certain attitude he had adopted of late toward me an attitude of reproach as though in return for his many favours to me there was something i had left undone and when i went home i asked maude to call on mrs scherer on mrs scherer she repeated yes i want you to invite them to dinner the proposal seemed to take away her breath i owe her husband a great deal and i think he feels hurt that the wives of the men he knows downtown haven't taken up his family i felt that it would not be wise with maud to announce my rather amazing discovery of the ironmaster's social ambitions but hugh they must be very happy they have their friends and after all this time wouldn't it seem like an intrusion i don't think so i said i'm sure it would please him and them you know how kind he's been to us how he sent us east in his private car last year of course i'll go if you wish it if you're sure they feel that way she did make the call that very week and somewhat to my surprise reported that she liked mrs scherer and the daughters maud's likes and dislikes needless to say were not governed by matters of policy you were right hugh she informed me almost with enthusiasm they did seem lonely and they were so glad to see me it was rather pathetic mr scherer it seems had talked to them a great deal about you they wanted to know why i hadn't come before that was rather embarrassing fortunately they didn't give me time to talk i never heard people talk as they do they all kissed me when i went away and came down the steps with me and mrs scherer went into the conservatory and picked a huge bouquet there it is she said laughingly pointing to several vases i separated the colours as well as i could when i got home we had coffee and the most delicious german cakes in the turkish room or the moorish room whichever it is i'm sure i shan't be able to eat anything more for days when do you wish to have them for dinner well i said we ought to have time to get the right people to meet them we'll ask nancy and ham maud opened her eyes nancy do you think nancy would like them i'm going to give her a chance anyway i replied it was in some ways a memorable dinner i don't know what i expected in mrs scherer 
from maud's description a benevolent and somewhat stupid blue-eyed german woman of peasant extraction there could be no doubt about the peasant extraction but when she hobbled into our little parlour with the aid of a stout gold-headed cane she dominated it her very lameness added to a distinction that evinced itself in a dozen ways her nose was hooked her colour high despite the years in steelville her peculiar costume heightened the effect of her personality her fire-lit black eyes bespoke a spirit accustomed to rule and instead of being an aspirant for social honours she seemed to confer them conversation ceased at her entrance i'm sorry we are late my dear she said as she greeted maud affectionately but we have far to come and this is your husband she exclaimed as i was introduced she scrutinized me i have heard something of you mr parrot you are smart shall i tell you the smartest thing you ever did she patted maud's shoulder when you married your wife that was it i have fallen in love with her if you do not know it i tell you next nancy was introduced so you are mrs hambleton durrett nancy acknowledged her identity with a smile but the next remark was a bombshell the leader of society alas exclaimed nancy i have been accused of many terrible things their glances met nancy's was amused baffling like a spark in amber each in its way was redoubtable a greater contrast between two women could scarcely have been imagined it was well said and not snobbishly that generations had been required to make nancy's figure she wore a dress of blue sheen the light playing on its ripples and as she stood apparently wholly at ease looking down at the wife of adolf scherer she reminded me of an expert swordsman who with remarkable skill was keeping a too pressing and determined aspirant at arm's length i was keenly aware that maud did not possess this gift and i realized for the first time something of the similarity between nancy's career and my own she too in her feminine sphere exercised and subtly a power in which human passions were deeply involved if nancy durrett symbolized aristocracy established order and prestige what did mrs scherer represent not democracy mob rule certainly the stocky german peasant woman with her tightly drawn hair and heavy jewels seemed grotesquely to embody something that ultimately would have its way a lusty and terrible force in the interests of which my own services were enlisted to which the old american element in business and industry the male counterpart of nancy willett had already succumbed and now it was about to storm the feminine fastnesses i beheld a woman who had come to this country with a shawl over her head transformed into a new species of duchess sure of herself scorning the delicate euphemisms in which fancy's kind were wont to refer to a social realm that was no less real because its boundaries had not definitely been defined she held her stick firmly and gave nancy an indomitable look i want you to meet my daughters gretchen anna come here and be introduced to mrs durrett it was not without curiosity i watched these of the second generation as they made their bows noted the differentiation in the type for which an american environment and a finishing school had been responsible gretchen and anna had learned in crises such as the present to restrain the superabundant vitality they had inherited if their cheekbones were a little too high their delft blue eyes a little too small their colour was of the proverbial rose leaves and cream jean hollister's difficulty was to know which to marry they were nice girls of that there could be no doubt there was no false modesty in their attitude toward society nor did they pretend as so many silly people did 
that they were not attempting to get anywhere in particular that it was less desirable to be in the centre than on the dubious outer walks they too were so glad to meet mrs durrett nancy's eyes twinkled as they passed on you see what i have let you in for i said my dear hugh she replied sooner or later we should have had to face them anyhow i have recognized that for some time with their money and mr scherer's prestige and the will of that lady with the stick in a few years we should have had nothing to say why she's a female napoleon hilda's the man of the family after that nancy invariably referred to mrs scherer as hilda if mrs scherer was a surprise to us her husband was a still greater one and i had difficulty in recognizing the adolf scherer who came to our dinner party as the personage of the business world before whom lesser men were wont to cringe he seemed rather mysteriously to have shed that personality become an awkward ingratiating rather too exuberant ordinary man with a marked german accent from time to time i found myself speculating uneasily on this phenomenon as i glanced down the table at his great torso white waistcoated for the occasion he was plainly making up to nancy and to mrs ogilvy who sat opposite him on the whole the atmosphere of our entertainment was rather electric hilda was chiefly responsible for this her frankness was of the breathtaking kind far from attempting to hide or ignore the struggle by which she and her husband had attained their present position she referred with the utmost naivety to incidents in her career while the whole table paused to listen before we had a carriage yes it was hard for me to get about i had to be helped by the conductors into the street cars i broke my hip when we lived in steelville and the doctor was a numbskull he should be put in prison is what i tell adolf i was standing on a clothes horse when it fell i had much washing to do in those days and can nothing be done mrs scherer said leonard dickinson sympathetically for an old woman i am fifty-five i have had many doctors i would put them all in prison how much was it you paid dr stickney in new york adolf five thousand dollars and he did nothing nothing i'd rather be poor again and work but it is well to make the best of it your grandfather was a fine man mr durrett she informed hamilton it is a pity for you i think that you do not have to work ham who sat on her other side was amused my grandfather did enough work for both of us he said if i had been your grandfather i would have started you in puddling she observed as she eyed with disapproval the filling of his third glass of champagne i think there is too much gay life too much games for rich young men nowadays you will forgive me for saying what i think to young men oh forgive you for not being my grandfather at any rate replied ham with unaccustomed wit she gazed at him with grim humour it is bad for you i am not she declared there was no gainsaying her what can be done with a lady who will not recognise that morality is not discussed and that personalities are tabooed save between intimates hilda was a personage as well as a tartar laws conventions usages to all these she would conform when it pleased her she would have made an admirable inquisitorial judge and quite as admirable a sick nurse a rare criminal lawyer likewise was wasted in her she was one of those individuals i perceived whose loyalties dominate them and who in behalf of these loyalties carry chips on their shoulders it is a long time that i have been wanting to meet you she informed me you are smart i smiled yet i was inclined to resent her use of the word though i was by no means sure of the shade of meaning she meant to put into it i had indeed an uneasy sense of the scantiness of my fund of humour to meet and turn such a situation for i was experiencing now with her 
the same queer feeling i had known in my youth in the presence of cousin robert breck the suspicion that this extraordinary person saw through me it was as though she held up a mirror and compelled me to look at my soul features i tried to assure myself that the mirror was distorted i lost nevertheless the sureness of touch that comes from the conviction of being all of a piece she contrived to resolve me again into conflicting elements i was for the moment no longer the self-confident and triumphant young attorney accustomed to carry all before him to command respect and admiration but a complicated being whose unity had suddenly been split i glanced around the table at ogilvy at dickinson at ralph hambleton these men were functioning truly but was i if i were not might not this be the reason for the lack of synthesis of which i was abruptly though vaguely aware between my professional life my domestic relationships and my relationships with friends the loyalty of the woman beside me struck me forcibly as a supreme trait where she had given she did not withdraw she had conferred it instantly on maud did i feel that loyalty towards a single human being towards maud herself my wife or even towards nancy i pulled myself together and resolved to give her credit for using the word smart in its unobjectionable sense after all dickens had so used it a lawyer must needs know something of what he is about mrs scherer if he is to be employed by such a man as your husband i replied her black eyes snapped with pleasure ah i suppose that is so she agreed i knew he was a great man when i married him and that was before mr nathaniel durrett found it out but surely you did not think in those days that he would be as big as he has become that he would not only be president of the boyne ironworks but of a boyne ironworks that has exceeded mr durrett's wildest dream she shook her head complacently do you know what i told him when he married me i said adolf it is a pity you are born in germany and when he asked me why i told him that some day he might have been president of the united states well that won't be a great deprivation to him i remarked mr scherer can do what he wants and the president cannot adolf always does as he wants she declared gazing at him as he sat beside the brilliant wife of the grandson of the man whose red-shirted foreman he had been he does what he wants and gets what he wants he's getting what he wants now she added with such obvious meaning that i found no words to reply she is pretty that mrs durrett and clever is it not so i agreed a new and indescribable note had come into mrs scherer's voice and i realized that she too was aware of that flaw in the redoubtable mr scherer which none of his associates had guessed it would have been strange if she had not discovered it she is beautiful yes the lady continued critically but she's not to compare with your wife she has not the heart it is so with all your people of society for them it is not what you are but what you've done and what you have the banality of this observation was mitigated by the feeling she threw into it i think you misjudge mrs durrett i said incautiously she has never before had the opportunity of meeting mr scherer of appreciating him mrs durrett is an old friend of yours she asked i was brought up with her ah she exclaimed and turned her penetrating glance upon me i was startled could it be that she had discerned and interpreted those renascent feelings even then stirring within me and of which i myself was as yet scarcely conscious at this moment fortunately for me the women rose the men remained to smoke and scherer as they discussed matters of finance became himself again 
i joined in the conversation but i was thinking of those instants when in flashes of understanding my eyes had met nancy's instants in which i was lifted out of my humdrum deadly serious self and was able to look down objectively upon the life i led the life we all led and nancy herself to see with her the comic irony of it all nancy had the power to give me this exquisite sense of detachment that must sustain her and was it not just this sustenance she could give that i needed for want of it i was hardening crystallizing growing blind the joy and variety of existence nancy could have saved me she brought it home to me that i needed salvation i was struck by another thought in spite of our separation in spite of her marriage and mine she was still nearer to me far nearer than any other being later i sought her out she looked up at me amusedly from the window seat in our living room where she had been talking to the sharer girls well how did you get along with hilda she asked i thought i saw you struggling she's somewhat disconcerting i said i felt as if she were turning me inside out nancy laughed hilda's a discovery a genius i'm going to have them to dinner myself and adolf i inquired i believe she thought you were preparing to run away with him you seem to have him hypnotized i am afraid your great man won't be able to stand elevation she declared he'll have vertigo he's even got it now at this little height and when he builds his palace on grant avenue and later moves to new york i'm afraid he'll wobble even more is he thinking of doing all that i asked i merely predict new york it's inevitable she replied grant avenue yes he wants me to help him choose a lot he gave me ten thousand dollars for our orphan's home but on the whole i think i prefer hilda even if she doesn't approve of me nancy rose the sharers were going while mr scherer pressed my hand in a manner that convinced me of his gratitude hilda was bidding an affectionate good-night to maud a few moments later she bore her husband and daughters away and we heard the tap-tap of her cane on the walk outside end of section eighteen